Good evening, my name is Brian Gromkowski. I'm one of the assistant directors of graduate admissions here at William Patterson University. Want to thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us for our webinar. I'm joined here uh, by David Dempsey, who's going to be speaking about the Master of Music here, our uh, performance track and our composition and arranging track in jazz. Um, so he has a lot of good information that he's going to be able to share uh, with all of you and just going to do two or three little bits of housekeeping real quick before I turn it over to him and let him uh, get started with the presentation. First, I want to make sure you are aware if you are giving consideration to our jazz program here and you like what you hear, you're considering applying, uh, I would encourage you, if you're able to, um, to consider joining us for our upcoming open house, which is on Sunday, November 4th, from 1 to 3 p.m. I know we have a couple who are in attendance today from out of state. I realize that might not be a possibility, but I did want to make sure you knew in the event that you're going to find yourself in this area or if you could make the trip. Uh, we'd certainly love to have you. You'd have the opportunity to speak to uh, a representative uh, from our jazz program face-to-face, -face, talk over your interest and learn a little bit more about the program. So just save uh, that date if you were able to. The other thing I want to make sure you are aware is we are recording uh, this webinar in its entirety and we are going to make it to available to everyone usually uh, within a couple days. Uh, probably uh, tomorrow or the start of next week you get an email from our office that will include a link to our YouTube channel. So we know uh, life happens, you may have family work or other obligations and have to leave the webinar early. We want to make sure you're able to uh, refer back to anything you might need and certainly we want you to be uh, notes uh, free while you're uh, listening to the webinar. Just focus on the information that uh, David's going to be sharing with you. Uh, lastly, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box there. Um, we will uh, pass them along uh, to David if there are any for his opportunity to answer those questions for you at the end. Uh, and again, you can just type them in the GoToWebinar screen there. But certainly that's more than enough for me. I know you're here to listen to Dempsey and what he has to say. Um, so David, take it away. Thank you very much. Brian, as he said, my name is David Dempsey. I am the coordinator of the Jazz Studies program here. I've been the coordinator for 27 years, and I was in on the a part of the team that is that designed this master's degree 14 years ago. I'll get into a little bit of the history of the program later, but suffice to say, I can answer any of your questions either today or via email at any other time, or hopefully on a personal visit if you would like to come here. Well, I'm here to talk about our two Master of Music degree tracks. That is in jazz performance and jazz composition arranging. Uh, and as Brian said also, this PowerPoint is going to be available. You can download that or you can uh, uh, play the YouTube and pause it, but I'm going to have some links, some of some, for example, some YouTube links that, as you know, look like uh, somebody spilled a bowl of alphabet soup. So it may be better if you uh, download the the uh, PowerPoint, then you can just click on those links rather than try to copy them. Uh, for a lot of people, let me see. Wait, now I'm not the. Clicker is not clicking. Let's see if we can do this. Nope, we are seized up here. Let's see if I can make this go. There we go. All right, I'm going to use the mouse today, I guess. Uh, William Patterson, for a lot of people, is the perfect combination. We are 18 miles due west of New York City, of Manhattan, uh, easily accessible from New York, and we are essentially a New York jazz program our faculty, so many of our faculty are New York uh, major names in the jazz business. And uh, uh, if you're from this area, you may be aware that actually a lot of quote unquote New York musicians also actually live in New Jersey because it's more affordable and you can raise a family here and there are actual grass and trees here in New Jersey. So uh, it is a perfect combination. We have people uh, in the overall jazz program right now from 22 US states and six, seven foreign countries. And a lot of those people, you know, they, they come from areas where uh, they are musically ready for New York. They're ready to be part of this jazz community, but they may not want to live right in New York City, either just because of the 
hustle bustle and the the whole uh, lifestyle there, or uh, even more importantly, because of the cost of those schools and the cost of housing and food and everything. I will get to that later and the costs. Uh, we do have a uh, low tuition, very affordable tuition. And uh, yeah, that's, that's an important element here. Uh, this is a wooded campus. This actually looks very much like today did, except the trees haven't changed quite as much. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's hard to believe that you actually can get 350 acres of wooded campus this close to New York City. It's quite an amazing combination to get this kind of intense jazz experience, heavy New York City faculty, and this kind of environment where uh, the way I always put it is here at William Patterson, New York City has an on off switch. You know, you can go in to the city at any time and our students often do. It's easily accessible by public transportation, although usually the best way to do it is to carpool. Because if there's any more than, uh, if there's two people in the car, it's a wash. It's about the same cost as taking public transportation. And if there's more than two, it's cheaper. And uh, a lot of times the problem is not getting into the city. It's if you're going to see a 10 or an 11 o'clock show at a jazz club, it's getting back because then you end up, you know, you miss the 1 a.m. bus and now you're sitting around the Port Authority terminal between 1 and 3 a.m., which is not recommended usually. So uh, most of our students do just carpool it, but uh, suffice to say they are in New York constantly. I was just in New York City last night went to the blue note jazz club to attend robert glasper's show they were doing a uh tribute to mulgrew miller the late mulgrew miller who i'm proud to say was my partner in leading this program for eight years before he died way too young of a stroke uh, and uh, let me see that was four years ago already so yeah i've been in new york three times in the last week i see all of our students there so uh i've made my point i guess it's a you know, a very closely related program to New York. Uh, the great combination is that the tuition is about a third of what the major New York conservatories are. New York conservatories generally are about sixty to sixty-five thousand dollars a year, and if you get uh, some kind of a scholarship or an assistantship, you can take money off of that. But it's still a whole lot of money. Our tuition, which I'll get to the specifics in a bit, as I said, is about a third of that, less than uh, than 20,000 a year. And uh, also we have full ride grad assistantships here. Uh, with the new US tax laws, you may have heard about this, Congress has instituted new tax laws where uh, you may have noticed I said GAs, grad assistants, rather than teaching assistants. When undergrads come to school here, they want to study with Harold Mayburn or uh, Rich Perry or uh, Vincent Herring or Jim McNeely. They don't want to study with a doctoral assistant or a grad assistant. So we have, uh, these are sort of administrative roles that our grad assistants take on. But um, with that role means that they are part of this new tax arrangement, which means that the stipend that we offer basically covers the taxes. You have to pay tax on the tuition that you're saving with thanks to the US Congress. So at, at least the, the, the point still is that you're going to school for free and that we are paying the taxes that you have to pay. We're paying them basically for you. We're paying that amount. Go on to the next here. Um, one of the major reasons that uh, our students come here is to take a foothold in the New York City jazz community, you know, to really become part of that community. That community is sort of a small village within a city of 8 million. All of the jazz musicians know each other, they play together, they are interrelated. Uh, jazz is a communal thing. You know, it's a group art and you want to be part of that larger group. This is a group of our students with Benny Golson, the great arranger, uh, 
performer who is here. Oh, every I'm sure he will be here during your time here. Comes in, plays with the big band, does seminars. At one point, he did a two-year residency. Um, in two weeks, we will have uh, another National Endowment of the Arts Jazz Master. We'll have Jimmy Heath here with our students. Uh, in three weeks, we're having Barry Harris here. Uh, Ingrid Jensen will be here in the spring. We had Joe Lovano last spring. Uh, from an arranging point of view, we've had Maria Schneider was here recently. We take full advantage of the fact that we are that uh, close to New York City. Another reason they come is to prepare for a teaching career. And, uh, you know, having a master's in the jazz field is very good, necessary even preparation for getting a university teaching job. In terms of our alumni, some of our performance alumni are folks like Eric Alexander, saxophonist Bill Evans, a lot of great drummers, Carl Allen, Bill Stewart, Mark Juliana, Tyshawn Sori, who won last year's uh, MacArthur Genius Grant, who now is uh, on the faculty of Wesleyan University in Connecticut. We've had two uh, Monk vocal competition finalists and semi-finalists. We've had five Fulbright scholars studying here as part of the master's degree program in the last six years. Uh, our arranging alumni have won the Zurich uh, uh, composition competition. We've had three BMI Jazz Workshop Charlie Parker prize winners in the past uh, eight years. A lot of our arranging majors end up going to that BMI Jazz Workshop. It's almost like a finishing school. Chance to really get your music played by top New York musicians and study with people, again, like Jim McNeely and uh, Micah Benny and some of the other great arrangers around New York. Um, some of our academic alums, we have uh, grads now full-time teaching careers at over a dozen different schools, and of course, at the same time, launching major playing careers. Our program is one of the five oldest in the U.S. Uh, there are, were, although there were a number of several, at least, other New York area schools that were uh, offering some jazz courses, we were the first school in the New York area that offered a degree in it. Here we see uh, the great Thad Jones, who was um, our founding director, taught here for the first six, seven years of the program, uh, teaching uh, an improvisation class somewhere in the early 70s. Got the plaid pants on. You know, it's a whole different era. You put your cigarette up on the music stand and, <laughs> you know, it's a very different era here. But at the same time, the spirit of the program in many ways was the same. That is, as uh, my partner now running the program, the great Grammy winning pianist Bill Charlap says, you know, a great jazz musician is looking back into history looking at today and looking at uh, looking forward into the future all at the same time and we're trying to do that with this program and it's purposely small we have 20 people usually in the grad studies program in the graduate program overall jazz majors we have usually about 75 70 to 75 so um, it's a mentorship situation I mean, I've already gotten to know this year's new fall arrivals very well. Uh, we just uh, read a new arrangement by one of our new arrivals today. I'm getting to know her better already. You know, it's only been six weeks, but we're working closely together. That, that happens. You know, we have four new arrangers and six new performers this year. So that's usually about the, the size of it. And when when you do that, you really get a chance to intimately interact with people so that you can see what their goals are for their career. You can see what their strengths are, what they need to work on, et cetera. So uh, this stuff has been going on a long time here, as you can see from this black and white photo. Here is the performance curriculum. You can see the structure of the program, private voice or instrument lessons in the building, weekly, every semester, small ensembles. We have uh, 
the core of the program is 24 small groups here. And you would be, you're required as the master, well, required, this is why you're coming here, but technically you're required to be in one of these groups. Usually master's students take a second one as well, and that doesn't have to be for credit. In other words, if you're paying your own tuition, you can just be in another band. There are also courses in transcription and analysis. As you can see, everything is geared toward performance, transcription and analysis, topics in jazz history, advanced ear training, which is taught by Aaron Goldberg right now, the great pianist, performance practice, which is taught by Steve Laspina, landmark bassist, played with Stan Getz, Jim Hall, all sorts of people, entrepreneurship in the music business, research techniques, and jazz pedagogy. Uh, that is sort of the art and the craft of teaching this music, which is, you know, you don't get that any other place other than a very strong jazz program that's really connected to it, taught by veteran teachers themselves. And I should say, too, about the faculty, they are well-known players, people who have dedicated their lives to maintaining and building a performance career, but they're all equally dedicated and committed to teaching. In other words, when you see the faculty list with people, as I said, like Aaron Goldberg, Bill Charlap is the director, uh, you know, Steve Laspina and uh, Marcus McLaurin on bass. Marcus played with Clark Terry for over 30 years. Jim McNeely, Cecil Bridgewater, uh, Jeremy Pelt teaches trumpet, Rich Perry and uh, Vincent Herring teach saxophone, John Mosca teaches trombone, Nancy Morano is our vocalist. I mean, these people are veteran major jazz players, but they're also, my point is they're equally committed to teaching. They are here. You can set your watch by it. They're, they really want to be here. They like the scene here. And I, we have here in the music building in Shea Performing Arts Center, what I would call a, a critical mass where on any day, you're not only are studying with these people, but you're in the corridors with them. You're able to come up to uh, John Mosk and ask about his long history with Thad Jones or Cecil Bridgewater. You're able to uh, come up to Aaron Goldberg and talk to him about all the amazing touring that he has done and is doing, you know, with Dave Douglas and many other people. So you're, there's an interaction level that you can't find at a lot of other schools where people just kind of run in and dash out and you just they're just doing what they need to do and no more here faculty are here when they're here for the day um the i'm just kind of going through this list oh the one thing i did not mention is the thesis or tribute recital we have uh options some people who want a teaching job and who are looking to uh, get a doctorate want to write a thesis and have that on their record and they want to get those research chops up that's why they're coming here because they can play at a super high level and at the same time be a researcher other people come here as i said to really gain a toehold in the new york jazz scene and they want to start practicing eight hours a day and <clears throat> do anything but spend their time writing a thesis so there is a no thesis option there so you can go one of two tracks this year for example we have five performers graduating in may and two of them are doing a thesis two of them and three of them are not the arrangers do not do a thesis because their major project of course is writing all of the music for their graduation recital the as i said the core of the program is 24 small groups they each meet twice weekly there's also jazz orchestra in other words a big band and that big band has uh guests every year i mentioned uh, every semester rather i mentioned jimmy heath ingrid jensen usually in the fall i direct the band so usually in the fall is our uh sort of in the tradition time where we have people like Benny Golson and Jimmy Heath and in the past we've had Frank West and Phil Woods and uh, Clark Terry. I actually showed Clark about three slides back and uh, I'm so sorry did not mention his name but Clark was a staple here when uh, for uh, a number of years before he passed and uh, then in the spring 
it's stretch time. So that's why we have Ingrid Jensen and uh, uh, last spring, Joe Lovano and uh, Maria Schneider. Jim McNeely, of course, is on the faculty. So he we feature his music from time to time. And I'll get to those details as well. Here you see Christian McBride uh, as a guest faculty. Uh, he was an artist in residence here for a year. One of the other great things about being in North Jersey is Christian lives about 10 minutes from the <laughs> campus. So he's probably about the busiest person uh, on the planet. But uh, he took a year to be with us about half of the time. So that was a great year. And we continue to uh, be very uh, in touch with him and he with us. Here is the arranging curriculum. Those private instrument lessons are replaced in that case by private arranging lessons every week, every semester. You're also in small ensembles. The arrangers usually are in one of our performance ensembles, one of those 24 small groups. And uh, also they are in the arrangers ensemble, which is dedicated solely to playing the music from those people. The head of our arranging area, Pete McGinnis, heads that ensemble, and he supervises the music that's coming through and that uh, ensemble. Just like all the other ones do, they have a performance schedule. Uh, they go in the recording studio and record those arrangements. And we also have something here called the Dialogue Day, where uh, we just had this a couple of days ago where the whole program shuts down for an afternoon and uh, half we have two dialogue days a semester on each of those days half of our 24 ensembles perform a tune by a chosen uh, composer or arranger or repertoire and they get critiqued by their peers and by the faculty so it's great i don't know any other jazz program that does this and it's all on a super high level this past dialogue day was the music of dizzy gillespie and miles davis compositions and then on december in early december we will have uh the music of jerome kern so if you would like to come brian already mentioned that it's great to come visit the campus that would be a great day to come because you'd see you know on that day, 12 bands, each performing a different Jerome Kern tune. You'd see, meet a lot of faculty, see a lot of students. Um, your courses for the arranging area are transcription and analysis. Instead of um, the uh, performance seminar, it's topics and arranging, again, with Pete McGinnis, the advanced ear training, topics in jazz history, composing for the media, research techniques, and again, the jazz pedagogy course. Our ensembles play <clears throat> constantly on and off campus. Uh, this year, we will have right around 110 performances at different points during the year, about 50, 55 a semester. We perform on and off campus. We have something called the Jazz Room Series, which I'll talk about in a minute. But also, uh, we play at places like Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola in Jazz at Lincoln Center. That is, uh, this is a photo of our jazz orchestra playing at Dizzy's. I think this concert was, uh, we were featured with, uh, with uh, Randy Brecker. Let me kind of move on here. This is uh, a great snapshot of our arranging program because this gentleman conducting the band is not me. It's Dasul Kim, who is an arranger who just graduated last spring. And uh, the soloist you might recognize as the great saxophonist Joe Lovano. Uh, our arrangers every spring write at least half, sometimes more than half of the program for the soloists. So when Ingrid Jensen comes in this spring, our jazz masters arrangers will create that program for her. She's going to bring in some arrangements that she already has, but then part of the situation is she will uh, forward to us some of her compositions or some other tunes that she would like to play that she doesn't have a big band arrangement for, and our students will create those and we try to let them conduct them so this is a great moment this is uh you know doesn't get any better than this come out on stage conduct your own chart with a legendary performer and of course 
this was the icing on the cake you see in this snapshot but the real deal was the rehearsal where joe was here for three hours and we workshopped everything and got all the bugs out and he coached the students the arrangers on the their charts and even helped them conduct i mean joe's the best he's a great uh great teacher great educator and of course one of the great saxophone voices on the planet this is our director, a gentleman who's been the director here. This is uh, his fourth year already. And this is the great Bill Charlap. All of the faculty I was saying are veteran New York City names, major people on their instrument. I'd already mentioned we have actually five pianists. We have Bill uh, here as the head of the program. And in that role, he directs six of the 24 small jazz groups. So our role or our aim is to get every student in one of his ensembles at least once a year, sometimes uh, twice or three times a year. So everybody's working with Bill. Uh, we also, as I said, have uh, Aaron Goldberg, Kevin Hayes just joined us on piano. Uh, we also have uh, James Weidman, who actually is Joe Lovano's pianist, has been for many years in the US Five group. And we have the great one and only Harold Mayburn, who's uh, uh, one of the amazing uh, teachers and personalities and piano voices, you know, played with a who's who, you know, there's a great YouTube video of Harold with West Montgomery in about 1960. Harold was like a stick, you know, he was probably uh, 22 years old on that gig. And now he's not anymore, but I swear he has not one bit less energy from those days. He's, you know, the days when Harold is in the band, in the room, you can tell he's in the building. The whole building is a buzz, you know. And here he is, Harold, hanging out with a group of our students, conferring, talking about his time, interacting with, you name it, Dexter Gordon, Coltrane, Hank Mobley. He has lived it. So, you know, as I said, at its core, you know, this is as good a snapshot as you can see about being at William Patterson. Yes, of course, we have a set curriculum and you'll be working through that curriculum. But uh, for a lot of students, the best moments are sitting in talking like this and realizing that jazz is a continuum. It's a, a you know, thread of history and you by coming to this program and being part of the New York City jazz community, you are a part of that history. You're a part of that continuum as you get to know these, these great uh, players. There are many performance opportunities here. I was mentioning earlier our Jazz Room series. This is um, one of our student groups as an opening act on the Jazz Room. The Jazz Room is now in its 41st year in the uh, in operation or in existence. It is the longest running campus based jazz concert series in the nation. And again, we take full advantage of our close proximity to New York City. This uh, is 12 concerts a year and the concerts happen at four o'clock on Sunday afternoons. Uh, what jazz musician is not free at four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon? And that's how we get people. You know, a lot of people, you know, if we were in some other part of the country, it would cost us many thousands more to get these great artists. But here they can perform here at four o'clock and they're home for dinner. And uh, the students get to interact with these artists. Obviously, it's a it's a public uh, series. People buy tickets to this or subscriptions. And we have a great <coughs> public uh, audience of 250 to 400 every week. But the students get in for free with their ID. And as you see here in this uh, photo, the students probably the most uh, meaningful part of the jazz room for them is that each week one of our 24 student ensembles is the opening act. So they come out and uh, uh, present their music before uh, some of these great soloists show up. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this uh, semester we have, uh, we just had the great singer Renee Marie here. She's just fabulous. If you ever get a chance to hear her, we had Barry Harris. We will uh, next week have uh, our, one of our own legendary guitar faculty, Gene Bertoncini, with uh, his longtime uh, friend and collaborator, vibist Mike Manieri. We will have uh, pianist Rini Rosnes with her 
uh, quartet, which is kind of an all-star quartet. We will have Jimmy Heath, as I said, with the big band. And all of these concerts will be preceded by one of our student small groups. This uh, next photo is uh, uh, another one of our small groups. This is not in the jazz room. This is at Dizzy's. And uh, they sometimes play original uh, uh, compositions. Sometimes they're playing standards or jazz standards or newer uh, literature. Some of our small groups, too, I should mention, are what we call concept groups. These groups are actually designed by the students. So, for example, they could say, we want to study uh, the music of Percy and alto and a tenor player. We want to study the repertoire that was played by Sonny Stitt and Gene Ammons. And we want, we're all free at this time to rehearse and we want to study with Rich Perry. And if that gets approved, then that becomes one of your required ensembles. So we're trying to get students to develop that leadership situation and develop you know, their sense of direction now while they're in school. Here's one of the pro groups on stage at the Jazz Room a couple of years ago, legendary Roy, the ageless Roy Haynes. Roy is now, I think, 92, still lugs his own drum kit. I mean, he's <laughs> true, a true uh, living miracle. And if you ever get a chance to hear Roy, uh, in person, don't miss it. And of course, the, the lucky students who opened for Roy, they got a chance to hang out at the sound check, share a dinner with them backstage. Roy was mentoring everybody and the great players in his band. That's David Wong on bass. Yeah, Jamil, Jaleel Shaw on saxophone. Yeah, I mean, you just get a chance to, to be right in the center of the uh, performance field when you're here at William Patterson. Another <clears throat> huge element, oh, I skipped one. Here's uh, another view of our big band uh, interacting with two guest soloists who are actually members of our faculty. One of our jazz uh, grad students wrote this arrangement that to feature our two saxophone teachers. That's me conducting. And that is uh, on left, Rich Perry, great tenor saxophonist, plays with the Vanguard Orchestra, plays with Maria Schneider, and that is Vincent Herring, legendary alto player, really one of the great powerful alto voices today on the scene. And uh, <clears throat> they wrote this is arrangement of standard tune for these two soloists. So we bring them, brought them to Dizzy's with us. We played on campus. It's a great, and I think it's actually the first time that these two great saxophonists had performed together. They certainly know each other. Most of our students study with both of them while they're here, but they'd never performed together. So nice uh, view of that. Another large element of the program, uh, this I started the sentence once before, is the Living Jazz Archives. Living Jazz Archives uh, is comprises the collections of Thad Jones, Clark Terry, Michael Brecker, Jim McNeely, Don Sebesky, James Williams, and soon to come uh, Mulgrew Miller, and there are more planned. These are the original materials of these artists. In other words, Thad Jones' original pencil scores, uh, Michael Brecker's original uh, practice and composition notebooks, all the music from Mike's. Uh, I knew Mike for 30 years, so that connection and that archive came through Randy Brecker, who is a constant presence on campus here, <laughs> at least every couple of years. We have him back as a guest and uh, as you know, sadly, Mike died in 2007, and uh, our students are getting to know him very well, thus the name Living Jazz Archives. The concept is actually that of Clark Terry, who was a genius on a lot of levels, not just a great trumpet player and teacher. He came to us and I said, uh, Clark, with all due respect, knowing that the Smithsonian has been courting you for 10 years. Why did you choose to have, because he came to us and I said, why did you choose to have your archive in Wayne, New Jersey? And he said, oh, all those other places are for dead people. And I said, what do you mean, Clark? And he said, well, there are, you know, 
your stuff goes there, but you have to have an appointment a month ahead of time and fill out all the paperwork. And then they give you a half a day with the stuff. And then you put it back in the box to, after you've looked at it and they take it back to the warehouse. He said, I want my stuff to be stored at the same high archival level, but I want copies of the, that music to be on the stands with the students. I want ensembles to be playing my music. I want students to be studying the music in the archive. I want my trumpets to get passed down the line in the section. I want my legacy to be passed on that way. He said, you know, we're not talking about, uh, this is Clark talking, he said, we're not talking about me being old now he said we're talking about 75 80 years from now when there's nobody around who knew me nobody who even knew anybody who knew me what is my legacy and now it's like we ask the same question with michael brecker and with uh, uh thad jones and of course some people jim mcneely as you well know you might have been shocked to hear that name he's very much alive and well but he's downsizing and he just gave us uh, almost 500 scores, not only the stuff from the Vanguard, but the WDR music, the uh, uh, Stockholm Jazz Orchestra, the Danish Radio Orchestra, all of his scores and parts. So it's uh, quite a gold mine for arrangers to study. Here are some of the, on, on the left in this glass case is uh, uh, one of the pages from Thad Jones' uh, man, original pencil manuscript for Groove Merchant. That's the front page to that manuscript. And, uh, of course, we have the whole thing. That's uh, one of Michael Brecker's tunes. It's one of Clark Terry's original compositions. It's James's in the middle. You can see James Williams' great composition, Alter Ego, that was uh, performed by Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. Also, is probably more well known on one of James's solo albums. So, you know, the archive is an amazing primary source collection for you. Many students have uh, now aimed their thesis topics around that. They do paper topics, and it really, uh, as I was mentioning before, jazz is a continuum, and each player takes their place in the history of the music this collection and this uh, access that you have to this collection uh, allows you to feel your past. You can experience your past directly. Therefore, the name Living Jazz Archives. You know, a lot of times when our students spend a half a day over in the archive, they kind of walk out and go, you know, I feel like I kind of was just hanging with Thad Jones for a while. I really feel like I'm kind of inside his mind a little bit. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. And by the way, the website, which um, is relatively new, it's not on this uh, PowerPoint, but you can take note that is just www.livingjazzarchives.org, the plural, livingjazzarchives.org. Or you can go thadjonesarchive.org, michaelbreckerarchive.org, clarkterryarchive.org, etc., and it'll get you to the same page. So you can use this website. The website show shows what we have in the collection, shows a collection of uh, photos and everything from that artist. So you can you can uh, work with it from uh, any state in the union or from any country in the world. The best thing is to be here and use it yourself. Let's talk money. Uh, as I said, we have full ride GAs that cover 100% of the tuition, but here is the bottom line. Full-time study here is nine credits. You know, in graduate land, it's not like undergrad where you're taking 15, 16 credits. You're taking fewer credits, but each one of those courses is a little bit of a lifestyle you're doing. You know, if you take our transcription and analysis class, you are doing a transcription a week. You are writing a solo in the style of Coleman Hawkins or Charlie Parker or Coltrane or Bill Evans every week. You're really putting in time. So it's a nine credit full-time load, and that would be, this cost, by the way, is per semester. So you can double it. So it's about, uh, you can see bottom right, it's about, in, out of state, it's about 21,000 a year, which compared to the New York 
conservatories, as I said, it's about 30% of that cost. And here is the in-state. I don't think any of you are listening today from New Jersey, but uh, we do have often uh, uh, students from New Jersey, from some of the other schools in New Jersey, from Rutgers or from other area schools. And we also have pro players come through the program, which is always exciting when a pro player decides they're gonna kind of retool. And uh, while they're uh, maintaining their performance career, they come in and take classes. That tuition, if you look at the bottom right, if they're taking a full load, it's about a little less than 15,000 a year. And uh, you can pause and, uh, uh, and look at all these uh, different informations with the per credit and the fees, et cetera. If you have any specific uh, points, you can certainly uh, email me and uh, let me know. But those are the numbers. Here's how to apply to William Patterson. You first need a university application, university-wide application and recommendations. You'll see all those prompts. And uh, you need a music department application that tells us things like uh, what material you've studied uh, and uh, what your repertoire list and what what specifically you're doing now as a musician, what your goals are as a musician, and then you upload your audition audio tracks to our slide room site. Our audition, uh, you will be, uh, if you're listening in another country, you will be relieved to know that we do not have in-person auditions. Rather, it's all uploaded. Uh, we do encourage people, I'm uh, please, uh, inviting all of you now consider this an open invitation to come here for a visit bring your instrument or if you're a singer you know bring your voice and sit in on some of our 24 ensembles and basically be a student here for the day and really experience the place but uh, the auditions do not require you to do that and then the link for all of this with all of the uh uh, specifics. Here is uh, the first link that I mentioned that's uh, unspeakably long, although it's not bad. WPUNJ.edu slash COAC, that's the College of Arts and Communication, slash departments, slash music, slash graduate, slash jazz underscore grad dot dot. <laughs> that's a long thing. But you know what else you can do uh, that I'm uh, so far not allowed to do, but um, there's a shortcut. You can go wpunj.edu slash jazz. And if you do that, you will shortcut this. So that's how to apply. And obviously, if you have specific questions, uh, we can uh, talk about that and we can, you know, get more into specifics. I can do that via email, but here are some more specifics. And this is a lot of text. If you're watching on YouTube, you can just stop this. These are all the specifics of the uh, uh, application process. We have suggested tunes, but you can uh, feel free to include originals if you're a performer. We have three, it's basically a minimum of three tunes, an up-tempo tune, a ballad, and a medium-tempo tune. <clears throat> and they don't have to be specifically, quote-unquote, jazz, whatever that is. These days, it, it's a very broad art form, as I'm sure you'll agree, but we suggest some standard tunes that uh, fit the category and really show us what you can do. Uh, for arranging, you have to a portfolio of a minimum of three scores with an accompanying recording. And we, <laughs> that's kind of funny. We have a CD or tape. How's that for antiquated wording that we need to change? Tape. You may be aware that humans use these devices at one point to record music. So you're uploading. Sorry, that should just read that you're uploading these. One selection has to be a large ensemble work that is big band or jazz orchestra like a studio orchestra if possible please a cross representation of different styles tempos and instrumentations and you can also this is true for performance as well in, in addition to jazz pieces other styles can be submitted uh, as i said for performance you can have original compositions you can just add that to the list and then there's some specific notes for pianists for drummers bassists and for vocalists We also have, you might be interested in uh, 
a video that we did five years ago when we had our 40th anniversary, but the facts are still really the same. It's a YouTube video called William Patterson Jazz, 40 Years Pioneering Jazz Education. And uh, it's interviews with me, with, uh, you can get to hear Mulgrew Miller talking about it. And uh, uh, it's basically a video portrait of the program. You can hear from some of the students and uh, kind of see the program in action and see some of the facilities. The thing, the, the video starts with Mulgrew and me playing Body and Soul in our recording studio. It was always a treat for me to play with Mulgrew. Um, didn't have that chance often enough, but uh, always a treat to, to do that because he was and is a giant. So you can take a look at that. And it's better just to say uh, William Patterson Jazz, and this will come up. Actually, the, the uh, thumbnail photo on that is a photo of James Williams. This uh, also audio, of course, all the way you'll get to hear James Rufus Reed, who Rufus ran this program uh, for 20 years. He was the one who hired me, the landmark bassist, and uh, you, know, you get a chance to hear that. Bill Charlap, actually, since you're hearing from Mulgrew Miller, Bill Charlap had not yet been hired. So uh, you know, Mulgrew was still with us, thank God, back then. So uh, yeah, but it's a great it's a great video, and you've got another uh, <laughs> untenably long uh, link that you can click on if you've downloaded the thing. But just as I said, William Patterson Jazz will do it, and you can get there. Here's our contact information. You can click or call, as they say. I feel like my radio voice. Click or call, wpunj.edu. Music admissions at WPUNJ. That's the music admissions office ma uh, email list. My uh, name is, again, David Dempsey. There's no P in my last name. So it's D E M S E Y D, Dempsey D at WPUNJ.edu. And those are the phone numbers for music admissions and for the grad admissions office where I'm sitting right now uh, transmitting from the grad office. Uh, the big thing, as I said, the main point to close that I want to make for you is please consider this an open invitation to come for a visit. If you are here in the spring, for example, to audition for one of the other New York jazz programs, please do not leave without making a trip out here. You can get out here in about 40 minutes if the traffic gods smile upon you and uh, spend some time with us and really get to know the program and get to know all the programs where you apply. That's my sort of global advice taken off my little William Patterson beanie here. You know, every school looks fantastic on paper or as they say on paper, but on the internet, the websites, uh, as Brian was just saying before we went on air, it's an arms race. All the websites are looking better and better. The branding is looking better and better. There are programs out there that have fantastic websites that you know you need to go and find out for yourself whether the facts on the ground actually match what you're seeing on the website. And here at William Patterson, I'm sure that they will. Because not only is it a super high level program, but I think you'll find that the atmosphere here is really great and warm and welcoming. You know, James Williams, the late James Williams used to say, uh, there's 24 hours in the day, the gig only lasts two or three hours, and you have to account for the other 21 or 22. In other words, there's too many great players out there today that are also equally great people. And you'll see examples of that very thing from our faculty here at William Patterson and from the students. So uh, the culture here is one that will help you build your career, not only as a musician with those skills and that historical knowledge and the creativity to move forward, but it'll also show you how to build the career, your career by being able to interact and relate to other people on many levels and in many styles of music. Well, Brian, we have, according to 
the official William Patterson time. I have about seven minutes left before six o'clock. If there are any questions, I would be glad to answer those at this time. You may have come up with some questions and uh, we can take it from there. Thank you are, you, are you there, Brian? I am. I am, David. Thank you very much. Great. Um, we did have a number of questions come through uh, during your presentation. I believe you've answered a couple of them. So um, for those who submitted the questions, if you feel anything uh, was left out or wasn't covered, um, feel free to type so in the, the chat box. But I'm going to focus on the ones that I think either weren't touched upon or perhaps David can elaborate a little bit further for you. Um, so sure. the first one, uh, if a student, a potential applicant uh, has some concern, either they feel they don't have uh, the recordings necessary or they're not happy with the quality of the recordings, um, is MIDI acceptable as a format? Oh, this is a question from an arranger. In yes. other words, can you send MIDI files of your uh, compositions? Yes. How's that for a one word answer? <laughs> yes, that's okay. The best thing for us and frankly for you in terms of your career, if you can possibly do it, even if you might have to pay, is to actually get human beings to play your music so that we and the listener can really hear what your pieces sound like uh, in real time from real people interpreted and uh, you know it's a good test for your notational ability and everything but yes if you're in a situation where that's just going to not going to be possible then most certainly an arranger can uh, submit a MIDI file along with their scores. And then could you just talk a little bit and again um, this is specifically for jazz arranging could you talk a little bit about what the expectations are for a student in the jazz arranging program um, and then sort of one step further if they were to get an assistantship um, what some of their responsibilities within your department or, or one similar might be sure do you mean was the question about expectations for admission uh, expectations I, once they get in here I think once they're in there I think what the expectations are of a student in the jazz arranging program well they're obviously writing a lot and one of the great things about this program is that the 24 small groups are available to you you can write for these groups any ensemble that you're in not only is it quote unquote okay if you write for the band there if if I'm directing a small group and I know there's a composer or arranger I'm insisting that you bring in music. That's part of the jazz world. You know, if you go to hear Joe Lovano, let's say, or Pat Metheny, you're not necessarily going to hear Joe or Pat play, you know, Autumn Leaves or all the things you are. You're going to hear them play their music. And so as you build your career, the point is to link your playing and your writing with your own music. So, yeah, that's a... A, a huge part of it. And then uh, well, another was the, the second part of that question. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. It was just um, what the expectations would be for a grad assistant if they were oh, either in your department or a related department. Well, the the uh, jobs are, as I said, uh, administrative in nature, and uh, some of those jobs are in the music department. There's a grad assistant in the jazz office who's uh, right now, as I speak, she is working in the Living Jazz Archives, helping to sort a huge box that just arrived of press clippings from Michael Brecker. And uh, we have another student over there studying Jim McNeely's scores, another grad assistant. So uh, you can do that, or there's uh, two grad assistants in the music admissions office. When you uh, contact music admissions, you will likely be speaking with one of them. Some of those assistantships also are around the campus in various offices. At one time or another, I know the grad admissions office has had some of our grad assistants here. They also work in a foundation that is the fundraising office, et cetera. And it's 20 hours a week. It's a 20 hour a week job. But if you multiply those hours out times the cost of tuition, it's not a bad hourly rate, really, because it's obviously not year round. It's during the semester. So it's a good it's really a good deal. Not many not many schools offer a 100% free ride. Usually it's, we offer, you know, they offer a half tuition or a third or et cetera. And this is a full ride deal for us. And then one more question. Um, can a student take private lessons on their principal instrument as an arranging major? 
Yes, they can. That happens often. The way I uh, need to say it is that it's on a space available basis. Um, in other words, uh, I obviously, if an arranger is a saxophonist, I can't bounce out a saxophone in, uh, performance major out of Rich Perry's studio to make room for an arranger. So I need to say it's a space available basis, but a lot of our students do uh, what I would call cross-pollinate. In other words, some of our performers are uh, studying arranging and doing some writing on their own, and a lot of our arrangers are active performers. That's the advantage of a small program, is that you can customize things like that. Well, I believe that is it for the formal questions. I will uh, stress again uh, to those that submitted a question, um, I felt like uh, David covered a lot of ground and touched upon uh, some of the questions that have been answered. So again, if you feel that anything wasn't answered sufficiently, or if you'd like David to elaborate, I can't stress enough, I think you've probably gathered, he's a very approachable guy. He'd love to hear from you and could delve into some of those subjects further. Um, for all of us uh, here in the Grad Admissions Office, uh, as well as David and the Jazz uh, Department, I can't thank all of you enough for taking time out of your schedule to join us for our webinar. Certainly hope this information was helpful. Again, just remember November 4th, we have an open house coming up. It's a Sunday from 1 to 3 p.m. If your schedule will allow it, if you're able to travel to campus, we'd love to have you and you get the chance to meet uh, at least one faculty member face-to-face uh, -face and talk about your interests a little bit further in the program. And also, just as a reminder, we have recorded this webinar. We are going to make it available to you probably either tomorrow or Monday. So you can be on the lookout for a link. If you need to refer back to anything, if you had to leave early, et cetera, there's a chance to catch up and just uh, see what it is you might have missed. Um, so, David, okay. anything you'd like to say before we yeah. sign off? Only, Brian, to reiterate that, yes, we do have these open house days from time to time here, uh, which is a campus-wide event, but you can pick any day, any weekday when the jazz program is up and running and just let us know you're going to be in town and you can come spend an hour or a half day or a full day here just being a grad student for a day and seeing what the experience is like. We will welcome you at any time. We'd love to meet you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Thank from, you. from all of us here, we hope all of you have a wonderful evening. Enjoy your weekend when we get there, and thank you so much for your time. Take care.